I'll warn the attendees to the webinar today that you're going to get hit with a lot of good news. And because sometimes that takes a little bit of convincing, I might throw a number of charts at you in a fast and furious fashion just to, just to make the case. But really, that's going to continue the trend of me trying to uh, sort of work against what the mainstream financial media has been telling people for a few years, which is that we were about to plunge into a, a recession. So I'm going to uh, take that argument apart once again and I think leave everybody that attends today feeling pretty good about where they stand as an investor. But we're going to start today with uh, the economic summary and the headline there is American exceptionalism before we then move into the other parts of the presentation, the key themes, a bit of a market recap, and then the last part, the market outlook, where I ask the question, which investor are you? So let's go ahead and jump into this economic summary with the headline being American exceptionalism. Now, that is a phrase that can mean some different things to different people and unfortunately has become a little bit political. But from an investment standpoint, American exceptionalism has really been the trend for years and we think will be the trend for years to come. So we might ask the question, why the U.S.? So let's take a look at this next page and, and look at just returns from the perspective of a U.S. investor, which is to put all the U.S. stock market into one category, international developed markets into another category, emerging markets into another category, and so on. Now, if you're, if you're from a different country, you can have your home country as the single category and lump all other foreign investments together. But this is typically the way we present the data. So when I say American exceptionalism, I'm not saying that there aren't instances where investing in a particular country hasn't done better than the US. But if you're looking over the any longer period of time, certainly five years and 10 years, the gap between the performance from investing in the US stock market and really all other asset classes is enormous. And so I'm glad that we have always overweighted the United States. We've adjusted our investment model twice so far this year. So we've been on three different investment models in just one year to make sure that we were maintaining that overweight in the U.S. It certainly worked out to the benefit of our, of our investors. One other takeaway from this slide might be one that we see show up in some other places, which is that you know, just in the long term, if you maybe look at the 10 the year charts, there's always been a reward for investing in equities. We can invest in fixed income and other safer asset classes like cash in the short run. But over the long term, equity investors have always been rewarded. So really two takeaways from this slide. Now, this is going to be the beginning of a bunch of uh, tables and charts that I throw at you to kind of make the case. And many of these slides have more than one meaning that I'm going to want to call out to you. So this is one of those examples where if we look at employment numbers from last year and then compare them to this year, you will see some slight changes. On its face, it looks like things have gotten just a little bit worse that's not the case for every category. For instance, adult women, 20 years and over, the unemployment rate has held steady at 3.1%, certainly less than it's been for adult men. Some other categories that show that, for instance, are Black or African American. Unemployment rates have dropped from 5.9 to 5.7%. Uh, and then a few others have ticked up just slightly. But the other big takeaway from this table would be that if you could compare this to numbers that we were seeing for decades, what, you, what you'd immediately notice, the thing that jumps out at me because I follow this data my whole career, is that all of these numbers are incredibly low. A little bit of movement from here to there, a couple of tenths of a percent doesn't really mean much. And also keep in mind that the unemployment rate is how many people are unemployed from those that are looking for a job? And one of the things going on here is that the size of the employment pool has actually increased. There's just almost no workers on the sidelines anymore. In other words, the participation rate has shot up 
And that's really the only reason that in the last year, the unemployment rate has gone up at all for any of these categories. So this is just a fantastic representation of the strength that we have in the American economy. And it's pretty hard to have a recession when more and more people are working, right? That means the economy is growing and more people have incomes. And in fact, more people are paying taxes. So it's good news all the way around. I want to do a little bit of a deep dive into an issue that has come up for years, and that is this idea of the participation rate. And it, it unfortunately tends to have a political angle. In other words, someone might say, well, the participation rate right now is at 62.8%, and that's less than it was two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago you know, pick your political point of view that you're trying to support with that kind of statistic. But a, a deeper understanding of the participation rate, which is, again, how many people of the potentially eligible workforce are actually considering themselves in the labor force, we've expected that to go down over time. So that red line is the long-term projection that we've been working with for three or four decades. We knew that demographics would drive the potential participation rate down. You can ask yourself, how many people in their 80s can we reasonably expect to choose to participate to be in the labor force? And there's a lot more people in their 80s or their 90s than there were decades ago. So naturally, that red line is going to fall. The real statistic here is to ask, what is our current participation rate? above the red line, how far above the red line are we currently sitting? And what you'll see is that over the past decades, there have been several times during both Democratic and Republican administrations where we've grown substantially above the red line. We had last done it during the Trump administration, and now we're doing it under the Biden administration. And we can certainly debate how much a president actually has to do with any of this, but what you'll see right now is that we've got more people participating in the labor force than we even thought was possible. We're above the red line. That usually doesn't last very long, but we're in a tremendous position of strength. So not only is the unemployment rate for those that choose to participate exceedingly low, but the number of people participating compared to what we thought was the available labor pool is extremely high and has been continuing to grow ever since the, the three-month recession brought on by the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, just one more subtle uh, element to the employment statistics that might be just a little bit different from what you've heard from the mainstream media. If you just want to cut through all of this data about participation rates and all that, you could just ask the question, and economists do, how many people have a job? So, of course, the population grows a little bit, but I will tell you a year ago, I was wondering if we had not maxed out the number of people that were actually working. I was optimistic then and thought it would go up a little bit, but I honestly didn't foresee that where we stand today is looking at an economy where there's 2.7 million more people working than there were a year ago, and only 100,000 of those jobs are part-time. So this increase has just shown, again, just how strong the economy is. And it could be because uh, telework is available from so many more companies than it was pre-pandemic. And that allows the labor force to be higher and more people to contribute. Uh, we're also starting to suspect that this increase in employment is being driven, not reversed, by the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, I ran into the CEO of an AI tech company just a few weeks ago, ironically, when I was at the dentist and he saw my BIP Wealth uh, shirt that I was wearing. And uh, we got into a conversation there where he was relaying that AI is, is driving employment higher. The, the analogy that he used was, he, you know, he asked the question, uh, has the advent of spreadsheets caused there to be fewer accountants? And of course, the answer is no. It just makes accountants more productive. So has AI reduced the number of people writing software code and doing other jobs with data analysis and, and marketing and all these areas where it's had an impact? No, it hasn't. It's just allowed them to be even more productive. So oddly enough, and against expectations, 
AI is driving economic strength in the economy and driving the employment numbers uh, even higher. One last statistic to call out on this slide is, is this one. And I put this in here because I'm anticipating some questions that we might have at the end, which is to say, um, you know, I heard on the news that a lot of folks are really getting hurt by inflation. I heard on the news that people can't make ends meet and they're dialing back on what they're spending. Well, from an investor standpoint, the thing to be looking at is, is one particular key demographic. And I had some of this on an earlier slide, but I wanted to call it out. For the working population that is, let's say, age 25 plus and has a four-year degree, the participation rate is 73.5%, way above the average, and the unemployment rate is only 2.1%, way below the average. And the reality for investors, the reality for economists is that even though some participants in the economy may struggle when inflation has been high or there's other circumstances, let's say housing costs have just continued to go up. If this group is doing well, the economy will do well. If this group is doing well, the stock market will do well. These are the prime earners in our economy and the reality is that they're doing great. So we can look at all these broad statistics, but it's probably worth focusing on this particular group. So one, uh, one other employment statistic that I've started to mention lately, just to sort of complete my case about how, how well the economy is functioning, is this idea of productivity. And 90 days ago, I suggested that this drop in productivity was probably very temporary. I think just an adjustment to a new economy, an adjustment to AI, um, and uh, that I thought that we might start to see productivity shoot up. Uh, if we look back through history, some of the times when we saw the biggest increases in productivity were during recessions. And that makes sense. You see a lot of employees lose their job, but the amount of work to be done doesn't necessarily fall. So some, some economists believe that we need a recession every few years just to trim the excess fat, as they might say, and force productivity upwards. But actually what we're seeing right now is a rebound in productivity, and I suggested that might continue. Well, as luck would have it, we had a, a new print for productivity just the other day that shows that productivity has now risen to an annualized rate of 4.7%, one of the highest readings that you could even find on that chart. So if, uh, you know, I like to keep my presentations honest and not go back and adjust the displays as new data comes in, but the newest print is to see 4.7, nearly a 5% increase. So not only is AI potentially driving employment higher, but certainly driving productivity higher as well. So with more people working and being more productive, that spells extremely good news for the economy. And so what has that meant? You know, I, I chuckle a little bit at this chart. What you'll see here is that the orange line is the Congressional Budget Office's assessment of maximum economic growth. And over the period of time covered, they've been underestimating the economy systematically. It's a long-term projection, and the only time we've dipped under it in the last decade and a half was during the pandemic, and that did not last for long. But what you'll see is that, again, we are growing at a rate that is above the CBO potential. The economy is bigger than the CBO thought it could be. And so the Congressional Budget Office uh, does a lot of analysis that you'll see sh show up in the political debate. And what we can see here is two things. One, that they systematically underestimate the strength of the U.S. economy. I think part of the federal government's, uh, let's say, overall lack of faith in capitalism. But the other thing is that the trend just continues to be upward for GDP. A much quicker read on the rate of GDP growth, a slightly different metric but related, uh, is shown in the blue line here. But I like to look at the red line, and that is a weekly number, the weekly economic index, which very reliably predicts where GDP is going to go. And so 90 days ago, when things had fallen, I suggested that we were not about to go below zero, but in fact, we had reached an inflection point. And the data I was seeing was that economic growth was now in a position to rebound. 
And in fact, we did just get a preliminary GDP read for the prior quarter that shows GDP growth at an annualized rate of 4.9%. So again, I'm, I'm keeping honest with the slides I've put on here today to say that was the data that I had at the end of the, at the, end of the quarter, the beginning of the fourth quarter. But what you see right now is that is that, that is actually jumped to 4.9. Now we probably won't hold to a rate that's quite that high, but again, it's uh, one more bit of evidence that the economy is actually doing fairly well. And so one last thing to keep in mind about economic growth is retail sales. Our economy is kind of unique and our headline is American exceptionalism. And in our economy, we're unique because retail sales are such a big part of that. So that can be the canary in the coal mine. You certainly see where it dipped during the pandemic and has always dipped in other recessions. But right now it is continuing to go strong and in fact appears to be on a trend line that cuts out a decade, really, uh, and is well above the trend line we were on pre-pandemic. And so boil all that down to the question that we keep getting asked and the question that we keep endeavoring to answer, which is, are we about to have a recession? The best statistic that I found for that, the one with the most predictive power, is in fact calculated by the Federal Reserve itself. You can go find this by searching under the FRED database, Federal Reserve Economic Database Data, and coming up with a, a print here. And what you'll see if you look closely is that in every other recession, except for the one uh, caused by the pandemic, we actually got some prior warning. The probability of a recession went up before we entered the recession. So that's a very handy thing to be able to see. There's a few times where it blips up and we don't have a recession, but it's a very interesting chart when you look at it. And the latest print there was that the chances we're going to have a recession in the near future are less than 1%. In fact, 0.20%. So to just continue this theme to give everybody some confidence in where we're going, let's talk about inflation for just a minute. You know, the Federal Reserve is convinced that it's the one that is there to deal with inflation, that it uh, is the, the guardian of us all. And in fact, we had a question coming in asking about the Fed leading us into a recession. And I think the Fed overstimulated the markets for too long. They always go too far, always have gone too far in overstimulating and then over, over retarding economic growth. And there's reason to be concerned. I've laid out the thesis for you all before that the Federal Reserve does not seem to have much confidence in capitalism as a mechanism for getting rid of inflation. But in fact, inflation is falling and the Fed is starting to see this data come through. I would argue that their raising rates may have had some effect, but capitalism is a wonderful thing. Capitalism tends to know how to deal with inflation all on its own. Uh, entrepreneurs see an opportunity to come in and disrupt markets, to undercut competitors, to figure out a, a leaner, more profitable way to, to uh, compete in a capitalist market, and that tends to be deflationary over time. And so we can look at the statistics that you'll often hear quoted by the Federal Reserve, which is the personal consumptions expenditures, and you'll see that they have been moving down now for about a year. So they can believe it's them, but that's certainly one of the justifications, I think, for them pausing on their interest rate uh, uh, increase cycle. An even better way to look at inflation would be this. We can take all the basket of goods that get considered when calculating the CPI, and we can actually divide them into core sticky assets and core flexible assets. So I'll, uh, I'll give you an example. When the Bureau of Labor Statistics tries to divide up the basket of goods that constitutes uh, the, the CPI, and they look at assets that don't change prices very quickly, those are considered to be sticky. 
And the stickiest, uh, the stickiest price out there is apparently for coin-operated laundry, which tends to only change price about every six years. And I guess if you're having to push quarters into the machine, it's a big deal when it goes up a quarter. So that's an, just one example, the most extreme example of a price that's very sticky. On the flexible end of things, apparently it's tomatoes that change price the most frequently about every three weeks on average. And so that's very flexible. And what we see is that the flexible items started to see their prices drop almost two years ago. And what happens is the sticky line chases the flexible line. And so even as the flexible line went down, it wasn't until it dropped below the sticky line that it began to bend the sticky line down. Well, if you look at where the flexible CPI is right now, it's at zero. And so now the sticky line is beginning to beginning to chase that down. Uh, you know, one, one example of some of this that's uh, interesting, and I, I was watching CNBC commentators try to figure it out today, is oil prices are a lot lower than, than, than folks thought. Um, and again, there's always market mechanisms out there that are trying to drive prices down uh, in, a, in a competitive market. And so this is one of the things that's going to pull overall prices down. And essentially, I think this is capitalism doing the work of the Fed. And as the Fed catches up to this data, and this is their data, this comes from the Atlanta Fed, I think reality is beginning to set in. And so in 2021, the Social Security cost of living adjustment was 1.3%, then 5.9%, then 87 for goodness sakes. Well, for 2024, it's down to 32 And I will not be surprised if in 2025, it's back down to about two. So it's still a giant question of whether the Fed will continue to overshoot and push us into a recession. But I think the folks that are predicting the recession are A, giving the Fed too much credit, and B, not giving AI and other forces of economic strength enough credit. You can only imagine uh, a company that builds software or does something else looking at all the fantastic benefits of AI. And you know, you could ask, uh, are they really going to not do that? Or are they not going to grow? Because interest rates went up another half a percent. I don't think that's the case. I think the Fed has far less influence going forward than it has in the past because of these fundamental strengths of the economy. So let's just take a minute and step back and review the key themes for all of 2023. We've been talking about these for nine months. The first is that stocks are a great hedge in a changing world. Equity owners have always been the winners, but fixed income is normalized. Inflation is falling, rates are up. We began saying this nine months ago, inflation has fallen more, rates have gone up more. So that's great for fixed income investors if you're doing it the right way. I do wanna watch out for volatility among individual stocks. When the world changes, such as it has been changing with AI, there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers, and it really is going to be hard to predict. And then lastly, private market opportunities abound. This is going to come up a few more times in the presentation, but let me make a distinction here between the public markets, where I've shown you lots of statistics, and the private markets, and maybe, maybe venture capital in particular. The disruptions that have taken place in the venture capital world have been absolutely enormous. You can say that they have indeed had a recession. Certainly they've had a price collapse and there has been turmoil in that market. Now that is probably not the experience that the folks on the webinar today have seen in their own performance reports. On the whole, the private market investments that our clients have been in have done pretty darn well. And what a great position to be in, to go into a market now with more private market opportunities where you might see the best prices, according to a lot of the folks we talked to, that have been available maybe for decades. And so we're seeing a lot of our clients move from uh, having most of their portfolio in public markets to having <clears throat> more and more in private markets. And as that happens, honestly, it just could not be at a better time, we think, because there are so many companies that we can put capital into at a price that, you know, could be half of what it might have been a couple of years ago or, or even better than that. And I pity the private market investors that loaded up on investments in companies where in some cases they've gone bankrupt or they've had their price cut by 90 percent. That's just not been the experience that our investors have tended to have. So good for us. 
So we're going to do a quick market recap about those public markets that have con continued to be fairly productive, but we're going to be kind of fast and rolling through this because honestly, it was a pretty boring quarter. So if we look at the BIP blended benchmarks, which goes from all fixed income to all equity, for the last 90 days, you know, both benchmarks were down between three and three and a half percent. So not a lot to talk about except for maybe this. Our way of investing in fixed income, you'll see when you look at your own report, probably did way better than that benchmark that you see because we have chosen not to expose the bulk of our clients fixed income to vehicles that get hurt when interest rates go up. Instead, they've been floating rate vehicles. So you may look at your quarterly portfolio report and see that your fixed income you know, was up 1%, for instance, for the quarter. Everybody's report will be a little bit different. But again, the equity markets were down about 3.4%. Heck, that's a day or two in the stock market these days. So if that's where we ended for the quarter, so be it. The year-to-date number for the global equity index at the end of September was still up 9.39%, which is above what we think the average year uh, is going to provide for investors. If we begin to break things down a little bit, well, we've got six red arrows to talk about this time. Um, we always like to remind folks what a really good quarter looks like and what a really bad quarter looks like. And the the, the real conclusion to take here is that it was a pretty boring quarter. A day or two in the markets and those numbers could have been positive or have moved around uh, you know, uh, even more than the, the negative value that you see. The only kind of bad news here is not completely surprising. That's for global real estate down about six and a half percent. But our clients barely have any exposure to real estate uh, in the public markets through us anymore. That's one of the things that we've cut several times this year. So, you know, for a lot of clients now, it's maybe 1% of your total equity exposure. So very, very small, just kind of a, just kind of a token amount, if anything. Within the U.S. stock market, we can dissect things a bit if we want to. And what you'll see is the parts of the market that did the best, meaning went down the least, were small cap and value stocks and we overweight small cap value so that probably added just a little bit to the return that our investors got another interesting point on this slide is that the u.s stock market is now 61 percent of the total 61 percent so if you go by a global equity index and that's our benchmark 61 percent of that is in companies headquartered in the u.s that is an amazing statistic to see, but that's where you end up when the U.S. outperforms the rest of the world for year after year after year. In international developed markets, overall things were down a bit, but what did the best? Well, value did better than growth and small caps did better than large caps. And since we overweight small cap value stocks, again, good for us. Our clients didn't have 28% of their portfolio in that. It was several percentage points less. I feel like I'm repeating myself here, but when we look at emerging markets, actually small caps were positive, definitely did better than large caps and value did better than growth. We overweight small cap value. So again, good for you. You wouldn't have had 11% of your portfolio, 11% of your equities in emerging markets through us. That would be closer to eight or nine. And then interest rates. My favorite slide because I like to talk about that treasury yield curve that's in the top middle of this. And the dark blue line is where we're at right now. It tells you the rate that you could earn for uh, three months T-bills all the way up to 30-year bonds. And, you know, there is this thought out there that now that folks can make about 5%, why the heck would you want to own anything else? And I'm going to tell you why later in the presentation, but it's not a bad argument. It's not a bad argument for somebody that has limited choices in particular. But you're right, we can go out and make an investor reliably 5% plus just investing in treasuries. And that's a big part of what we do. In fact, you've, if you look at the table at the bottom and for the last quarter, that three month treasury bill index was up 1.31% in the same 90 days that the aggregate bond index was down 3.23. So that green line at the top is the best representation of how we've been investing client money into fixed income, definitely not what you see with the, with the benchmark. All right, let's ask the question, which investor 
are you? So let's just do a quick review of what we'll call the investment toolbox. Now, this is a graphic that we've shown many, many times before. And in the investment toolbox, you'll see that there's a number of different strategies listed. And that's going to pop up on the next slide here. There we go. And I've arranged these into what is generally considered to be lower risk on the left and higher risk on the right. And as we put these up here, some of them may seem familiar to you. You've got them in your own portfolio. Well, BHP short-term tactical is fairly new, and that's a strategy whereby we invest in the treasury markets with floating rates. And right now that is with, I'd say, minimal risk at best, you know, yielding well north of 5%. Haven't been able to do that in a few decades. It's a lot of reasons somebody want to have some, might want to have some safe money in their portfolio. Maybe they're going to invest in some of these other things when the right time comes up. Maybe they're going to buy a house or a car or a boat or something like that. Who knows? But the BIP short-term tactical is showing up in more and more client portfolios because you're also not as concerned about FDIC coverage limits as you might be with money in the bank when we're investing in treasuries. As we look at all of the different things that you can invest in that go from lower risk to highest risk, the other end of the spectrum is this strategy called BIP concentrated stock. We built that because, as we said before, we think this is not a very good time to have a lot of assets in one stock. And so rather than just sell it and pay the taxes, we've devised a strategy using options to cut the day-to-day -day volatility down by about half as opposed to selling. And that's a great tax benefit to a lot of folks that have ended up with maybe too much in one stock. Now, there's all these things in between. You might have some of those. You might have all of those. There probably are a few investors that do. But the question comes up is, which ones are right for you? So let's go to the next slide and just suppose maybe you're that very risk-averse investor. Maybe you're in it for the long term, but you just hate hearing the bad news about the stock market. You hate seeing things move up and down. You don't like it when you look at your portfolio on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis and you see that there's been a dip. Maybe that just drives you crazy. There's nothing irrational about that. Well, for the last couple of decades, it was pretty hard to invest in a portfolio like that and even expect to earn the rate of inflation. There was a lot that you had to give up. We think those days are gone. One of the benefits of rising interest rates is, as we said before, we can invest in the BIP short-term tactical strategy, go into floating rate treasuries and be north of 5%, again, without worrying about FDIC protection limits. So think about that if you've got cash in the bank. But then why would these other strategies even be here? Well, maybe they don't need to be. Maybe BIP short-term tactical is all that you need right now. But there's other things that we can do that have a pretty good looking return assumption for pretty low risk. In particular, I want to call out private fixed income. Now, not all of our investors are even eligible, according to the uh, to the to the government rule makers, to invest in private markets. But most are. Private fixed income is an asset class that has been a smaller part of the toolkit in the past, but we're rapidly going to grow. And in fact. The return experience of most of our investors in private fixed income has been, frankly, well into the double digits for most of what they've done. So when I look at this, and let's say I'm talking to a, a new client who's very risk averse, maybe they don't have any concentrated stock, they've just got cash and the market scare them to death. I can see a portfolio that we could construct for them that's using the first four things in our investment toolkit there that have a return expectation of between eight and nine percent. Eight and nine percent is what we would expect to get out of being a 100 percent public stock market investor. So again, we can put together a risk of averse portfolio now with a return expectation that is essentially the same as being 100 percent invested in the stock market. Well, that is just an amazing thing to be able to do. So if you see this and you say, I'm that risk averse investor, I, I just hate risk. I'm not having to give you the bad news that you might have to settle for two to two and a half percent. I'm looking at this and the new tools in our toolkit and I'm saying it might be between eight and nine, depending on your particular situation. And that's fantastic news for those uh, for those folks that don't like risk. 
Now, let's talk about the risk-seeking investors, the ones that are really going for it. Well, you might be surprised to see VIP short-term tactical show up on there as well, because even for big investors in the private markets, where we typically think the most risk lies, sometimes you might have just received some cash from an exit. There's been a fair amount of that lately with probably more on the way, or you might be holding on to some cash that you're going to put into the markets. So if you're about to put cash into the markets, where do you put it, where it can be making north of 5% until you're ready for it, VIP short-term tactical. But again, there's private fixed income. Why would I put fixed income on there at all for a risk-seeking investor? Well, if the return experience has been that that's earned 50% more than the public stock market, why wouldn't you have it be a part of the mix? In fact, you could question if anything was going to drop out of this, might it be the public equity at all? Certainly on the private equity side, we've got investors that have had return experiences for well more than a decade that are so far into the double digits that we, we don't even model that type of return in our financial planning software. And yet when we have a big event, let's say the annual market reports that we'll be delivering in January and February, you know, we have these big dinners and, you know, a longtime client will sit next to a brand new client and I'll hear them talking and you know, sharing experiences and asking questions. What's it been like to, you know, to be here for more than a decade? And I've heard on more than one occasion, a longtime investor who has embraced private equity, sharing stories about how they, they bought the lake house they'd always wanted. They bought the boat to go with it. They, they've got all new cars. Um, they funded all the grandkids, 529 plans to the fullest extent of the, of the law. And now they're looking at a portfolio left over after that going, how did it ever get this big? And that's because of what the returns have been. Many investors have seen portfolio returns within their private equity where that part of their portfolio is doubled every three years. So, you know, you do that for a few cycles and, and you can just imagine what that's done for those particular people. So it's just been a great experience for the risk seeking investor. And if private fixed income and private equity markets are giving us some of the best deals that these uh, investors have ever seen, it might be even better in the future than it's been in the past. So if you're a risk-seeking investor, you still might need a little bit of safe money with short-term tactical, um, but we have these other vehicles available that where it's just, you know, some people would even say the deal of a lifetime. So I think if you're that risk-seeking investor, you should be extremely optimistic. Now, lastly, we'll wind up with the folks that are probably the rest of us somewhere in the middle, right? And you'll see that there's two tools in the toolkit here, public fixed income and public equity that are the mainstays of the investment business. And, you know, that's something that you're going to get, whether probably you're doing it yourself or any registered investment advisory firm that, that you hire, uh, including ours, for many people, it is the core of their portfolio. I just want to remind folks of something. If you can be long-term in your thinking, then volatility is your friend. Let's say, for instance, that you're kind of in the middle. Maybe your target portfolio is 50% equities and 50% fixed income. Well, when the markets go down, which they will inevitably do, we're going to buy equities. When the markets go up, which they will inevitably do, we're going to sell equities. And so a volatile market actually is your friend. It gives us more chances to buy low and sell high. I certainly remember the purchases that we were making into the equities market in the spring of 2020 as pandemic fears took hold. And then all of a sudden we hit a bottom and took off. So I'm very glad that we that we bought that dip. So if you're somewhere in the middle, and if even the only thing you've got is public fixed income and public equity, that's great to be in the middle because if we have a volatile market, unless you're ready to spend all your money in just the next couple of years, that could be the best thing for you. So even those investors should be excited. And of course, many investors won't just have public fixed income and public equity. They'll have some other elements, some other tools from the toolkit uh, in their portfolio as well. So I want to give some final thoughts here. Um, and I know that many of you uh, knew our uh, former employee, Jim Poole, who passed away just recently. Uh, about two and a half years ago, he came down with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And 
So named after a baseball player. And, you know, Jim Poole was a professional baseball player. And so spent more than a decade in the big leagues and became pretty well known doing so. But Jim was much, much more than that. And certainly more than that to us here at BIP Wealth. What I've put up here is a, a note that I sent to the portfolio management team the day after Jim passed away. Jim interviewed me when I first came to the company in 2011. And I got to tell you, he wanted to make sure that I was going to be the right kind of person to work at VIP Wealth. What I mean by that is that uh, he, he regarded what we do for all of you as a sacred trust. He took it very seriously and he wanted to make sure that we all did our best. And uh, there was a time after he had, he had left BIP for a bit to go be a math teacher, but he was an engineering graduate from Georgia Tech, by the way. And he had come back and he and I sat shoulder to shoulder in our Alpharetta office for a few years as portfolio managers. And we would compete. Who could, who could rebalance a portfolio to have the lowest costs, the lowest risk, the best return expectations, the best tax treatment, all of those things. And he was a formidable competitor in that uh, in that contest. And I just loved that time in my career getting to work shoulder to shoulder next to Jim. So I wanted to just mention this because Jim Poole not only had an effect on all of us, but he had an effect on all of you because he constantly reminded us of how important it was for us to do our very, very best uh, for you. And nobody at BIP Wealth took that more seriously than Jim Poole. And so, you know, I have a favorite picture of Jim to show you here. And it's funny, that looks like the Jim I was trading portfolios with just a couple, uh, a couple of years ago uh, up in Alpharetta when we were on the second floor at the end of the hallway. That determination that you see on his face right there is, in fact, the determination that he brought to work every day, even though there he's, you know, 21 or 22 years old. That just looks like the Jim we all knew. And so we're going to wrap things up now and we're going to find out if we've got some more questions. Bill, we did have one question come in already, and I think I kind of answered it, but uh, we can go back through it in more detail if you like. With that, let's start with the uh, question and answer segment. So, Eric, the first question coming in from Leo, uh, Jeremy Siegel recently said that the Fed will lead us into a recession if it does not start cutting rates soon. Uh, I also read that the money supply has decreased more than 2% for the first time since the Depression. And with interest rates at 5% on safe money, the market is facing significant uh, headwinds. What does this mean for a retirement portfolio that is in distribution phase? Well, Bill, as you know, I've been uh, telling everybody that showed up on CNBC, almost without exception for the last three years, that they were wrong and we were right. And we've, we've won that battle so far. However, Jeremy Siegel is a, is a formidable uh, uh, thinker about a lot of things. I think that a lot of folks looking at the markets right now, again, are discounting the powerful beneficial effects of capitalism, of the American entre entrepreneurial spirit, what innovation does to an economy. And so I think we've all become a little bit too wrapped up in the statistics and ignored the fact that we are living right now at a time with one of the most fundamental changes to the way human beings conduct business, uh, operate their lives, make decisions, and uh, interact with an economy. And that is because we are now in the age of artificial intelligence. And it changes everything. And I just don't think it's being given nearly enough credit. Now, to reach out and, and sort of address the specific issues he talks about, you all may remember that the money supply skyrocketed during the pandemic. At one point, about a third of every dollar that was in your own wallet was, uh, as I like to say, a toddler just a couple of years old. So we probably needed to shrink the money supply a little bit after expanding it dramatically. And as I got to in the last part of the presentation there, whatever kind of investor you are, I think there's a very good reason to be optimistic, even if you're that risk averse investor. And I think if you're taking distributions, if you're if you're taking advantage of all the tools we have in the toolkit, you should be fine. Good. Thank you for the question, Leo. Uh, we have another really good question here from Will. Um, Eric, can you provide some insight into a potential or probable government shutdown? and how that impacts the overall U.S. economy. Yeah. 
it's a little bit of a wild card, to be honest with you. The assumption for most economists, as opposed to market watchers, has been that the government will always figure out a way to get through, that there's nobody participating in the government in a position of decision making that would ever say the government needed to stay shut down for more than a very short period of time. It, economists assume that there's no person in a position of decision making within the U.S. political structure that would ever say that the U.S. government is not is not going to pay its bills, is not going to honor FDIC protection, is not going to you know, make sure the cash is there to pay off maturing treasuries, things like that. And that's always been the operating assumption. So the wild card here is that there's enough of a political stalemate that maybe some of those things don't happen. The reality is we can probably go a couple of weeks even with the government shutdown and not necessarily have it have a serious impact. It'll be a political fight. Who's to blame? Who's the good guy? We'll see all that play out. You know, whatever side you're on, you know, the other guys are the villains. I mean, you'll you'll hear all that with your politics. But from a from a longer term economic standpoint, the assumption is always is that the government will figure out a way to get through. They'll change tax rates a little. They'll fund some programs more than others. They'll they'll cut the budget here or there, whatever it takes to get through and that the wheels will just keep on turning. Good. Thank you, Eric. I have a follow-up question for you. You didn't have an economic chart about housing starts. And with mortgage rates increasing over the past year, what sort of impact has that had on housing? So there's two stories to be told in the housing market. And whenever I read a headline, it's inevitably only one of the stories. So there's two things going on. One is that, you know, a lot two-thirds of Americans own their own home, right? And and Almost no U.S. homeowners are underwater anymore. Most have a sizable amount of equity. Um, but a lot are not going to move. A lot are not going to go to another house if they've got to take out a mortgage because now interest rates are considerably higher. So homeowners are kind of standing still. And that affects the supply that we see immediately in the market because homes aren't being transitioned. And so home prices have continued to go up. In the long run, rising home prices is the best way to draw builders into the market. But if you're worried about the value of your home, I don't think you need to be because this lack of supply means that there's going to be more buyers for your home than there will be supply for for a long time. Under some of the estimates that I've seen, Bill, it's going to take the U.S. another decade of building to get the supply called up to the demand that currently exists. So if you're a homeowner, don't worry about the value of your home. I think it's pretty safe and probably gonna to continue to appreciate. If you're trying to buy a new home and you don't already have one, that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a tougher situation. The lack of housing starts can indicate in the short run, a little bit of economic weakness, but there's nothing like high prices to cause builders to move back into the market and to cause that to tick up. So if home prices stay stable or increase, which I think they will, I think we're going to see housing starts tick up. Plus, I think we're probably at the end of the rate rising cycle. And so you're going to see more and more folks uh, coming back into the market as buyers. Good. Thank you, Eric. Uh, question came in from Dan. Eric, how disconcerting do you find the ever-growing national debt? Is it just something for future generations to deal with? Or is there anything we need to be doing now? Well, if you, if, uh, if you go into some of the modeling tools that are available online from a couple of different websites and, and try to figure out how to fix it, something I've done, it, it seems unfixable. Like if you, if you cut government spending enough, you either have to get rid of the Defense Department, get rid of Social Security, or, or do cut other things so much that we, in fact, go into a recession or a depression. It almost seems like we, we can't get there from here. Uh, I like that the person asking the question framed it in terms of generations. The truth is that the generation that is sort of beginning to leave power now in Congress, you know, it is a generation that oversaw the largest expansion of the national debt that, you know, obviously we've, we've ever seen from a dollar standpoint, but also from a percentage standpoint. And it is going to be up to future generations to deal with it. And I, I've not quite seen this enter the political realm where it's a truly generational warfare, but I won't be surprised if that becomes a little bit more of the political rhetoric, because for the last 
40 years, the debt has just gotten far bigger than most people thought was sustainable. If there's any good news out there about that, it's that debt as a percentage of our GDP is not rising nearly as quickly as folks would have thought. In other words, our economic strength is helping us in the short term. So the amount of the nominal debt is going up. And in fact, higher interest rates really does make that worse because the cost of our debt has now begun to rise. But our economic strength is the one thing that can save us. And at this point, the dollar is still the currency of choice of the world. So, you know, we've got one of the strongest economies in the world and the dollar is the currency that the, that the, the global economy runs on. And I don't know how much more of a runway that gives us. It could be decades more. Nobody knows because we've never been in this situation before. So I'm a bit of a fiscal conservative and it worries me, but uh, I don't think there's something right around the corner that's going to cause us a huge problem. That's some really good, really good questions this afternoon. So thank you for everyone that uh, participated. Uh, at this point, this concludes our presentation. There are no more questions. So Eric, thank you. And I uh, really want to give a uh, an appreciation to all of you that, that joined us today and, and attended our quarterly market report. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.